All right, I'll go for it. This last section of chapter six, it's called complex numbers. So up until this point, tell me if you guys agree. Like in 6.1, remember how we start off with this problem back from our notes? It was the square root of negative 36. And what we found out is we found out this actually has no, or not a real solution. You could say no real solution, or you can say DNE, right? Well, we got one little small problem. Because this does have an answer, but the answer is not a real number. What you mean by a real number is it touches the x-axis. That's what we mean by a real number. Anything that does not touch the x-axis is not considered a real number. It's actually considered a complex number. That's what these guys are. So it's kind of interesting. If you think of math, math sort of, you, you learn how to add, subtract whole numbers, right? It's like third grade or something like that. And then you learn how to do integers, and then fractions, and then square roots. And all of that we use, in a sense, on a normal basis in mathematics. Then this, you got this complex numbers that they're sort of out here on the side. And where we use them, most of the time we use them in electrical engineering. That's kind of where you find them the most use. Do they sometimes apply somewhere else? Yes. But in general, it's almost like a, a little side issue. So it's almost like we're doing chapter six, chapter six, and we're like, okay, well, here's this little extra thing, okay? So, and the math is slightly different, and again, it's a sort of a specialized application, usually in, in the electrical engineering, so let's cover it. Okay, so now, if I were to say this right here, we're in chapter 6.6, .6, and I, again, I have to write it a little differently. So I say, write this in terms of I. That's kind of how I have to say it. Because it's, yep, so the 36 is, if you just think of it as a positive 36, the 36 is a perfect square. But because of a little negative inside there, we kind of think of this right here, right? The two multiplications that are happening. And so the 36 becomes a 6, but then we see we have a square root of negative 1. And that we're going to write in terms of just i. Because by definition, that's what it means right here. i equals the square root of a negative 1. Okay, good there. So what happens if you're to square this side? And what happens if you're to square this side? Oh. Okay, so if we take this one, I'm just going to take it off to the side here. If this is true and I square this side and square this side, which we learned how to do, remember that? With solving equations. So i squared becomes, well, what happens to the square root and the square? Cancel they cancel off. So now we're left with this right here. So whenever you see an i squared, the simple version of it is negative 1. And we use that quite a bit because we, we get i squareds quite a bit. Okay, so good there. Just the intro. Now let's go for it here. <clears throat> so whenever you see a square root of a negative a value, what we're going to do is we're going to really, in a sense, take out the i, and then we're going to concentrate on how do you deal with that. Do you have to do each and every single step in order here? No. you got to go from beginning to end. So if you see a negative there, i gets to go out, and then you look for this right here. And this is just on the regular rules that we have. So square root of 25, notice what we do is we put the i in front, sorry, the 5 in front of the i. Again, number 2, very similar. Because you see a negative, it becomes i, and square root of 49 is a 7, and you put the 7 first. All right, a little bit more complicated. Negative 12. Uh, take the i, put it out in front, and then 12 is 4 times 3, right? And 4 is a perfect square of 2, so the 2 goes out, and it's a multiplication between 2 and i. So notice how it's written. Coefficient goes first, then the i goes next, and then the radical afterwards. Some math textbooks, I don't know, just to be different, Sometimes they'll actually put the i in back of the root right over here, but nah, doesn't make sense. It's a lot more natural fit right over here. Okay, so what happens if 17 is here? The i still goes out, but 17 does not have a perfect square as a factor, nor is it a perfect square, so it stays. So notice it, we just sort of leave it like that. So technically there's like a little 1 in front of the i. Okay, good there. So let's go for it here. We, I think we just did that already, huh? Square root of a negative 36 is 6i to me. Cool. All right. 
And again, give you a little bit more variation here. Alright, so first of all, the negative is there, so the negative has to stay in, out in front, but because it's a negative inside, that becomes I, and then, you know, we can just do it all, all together. Everybody okay with that? I think we can do that all in one step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, negative on the outside, and just like we had the same rules in 6.1, it was the same thing. If the negative is on the outside, it sort of stays on the outside. And then you do and simplify the stuff inside the radical. Good. All right. Go for it. All right, let's go for it. Hopefully you guys are done. But I see a negative, that's gonna become an I. And 18, let's do that. 18 is really nine times two. Nine is a perfect square of three, so how about a three on the outside, I on the outside, and the two left over inside. I switched them, I thought that somebody else had the three on the outside. Mm, got it, uh, don't switch. All right, this one here, got the negative on the outside, is gonna stay. Because the negative inside, it's going to be an I. And then 19, 19. Wait, on the other one, it was the two, the three on the outside and the two on the outside. Yeah, let me go back here just to see. Right there. Okay. Okay, good. We're good to go. Okay, this is number four. Negative on the outside still stays negative. Uh I gets to go out and 19, is there a perfect square of 19 or a factor that's a perfect square? I don't think so. Actually, 19 is prime, huh? So how about just like this? So the 19 just sort of stays inside the root. How come the negative on the outside won't cancel off the negative I? Ah, cool. The question is, how come the negative on the outside does not cancel off the I? Because these guys are not the same, right? Okay. Remember, I is a square root of negative 1. It's not negative 1. So, But if it was I squared, then yes, we would cancel it all. Yeah, different type of number. If you say 3 or if you say square root of 3, those are two completely different numbers. But good questions. All right, before we get to the next type of problems, which is I to the certain amount of exponent. Let's talk about a little something extra. Not in your textbook. This is free. I'm not going to charge you for it, okay? So in higher mathematics, we say certain things are have cycles in them. Like um, this one, this one's called a cycle of one. Because zero to the one power is zero. Uh, zero to the two power is zero. Zero to the three power is thank you. To the fourth. And so we say zero to the two hundred fifty six power is zero. If you take powers of zero, still stay zero. So we say this guy has a cycle of one. It's always one single answer all the time. Ah, zero to the zero power it doesn't make sense in mathematics. Kind of interesting. I think we covered it in chapter five, I think we covered that topic. Okay, can you guys tell me another number that is also a cycle of one. Hey, all right, cool. Yep, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. one to any kind of power whatsoever is still going to be one. Has a cycle of one. Ha, next question, a little bit more difficult. Can you guys give me a number in mathematics that has a cycle of two? Cruz with his briefcase is all studious today. He says negative one, and that's true. Negative one to the one power is negative one. But negative 1 to the second power, positive. Negative 1 to the third power. And so, yes, notice that there, it always switches between. So we say this guy has a cycle of 2. And there's a little trick to it, right? Everybody knows the trick. 
So this guy would be a plus one or a minus one? Which one? Perfect, yeah. So we understand that it's so easy. When you look at this number, all we look for the exponent to be the even number. If it's the even number, we understand this guy to be positive. If it's a odd exponent, we understand this guy to be a negative. We're good? Okay, now let's apply it to our situation. So this is called the um, exponents of i, I think. This is the section. So let's talk about it. We got one little problem. I actually has a cycle of four. So if you say I to the first power is I. I squared is negative one. I cubed is, let's think of this here. Isn't it really just I squared times I? Because remember, you can add exponents when you multiply them. So if this is the case, isn't really I squared just a negative one? That's going to become negative one times I, which is negative I. Okay, going somewhere else with it. Let's see. I to the fourth. Isn't that really just I squared times I squared? All right. So that really technically is a negative one times negative one or a positive one. But notice if I keep on going with it. So I to the fifth is really just going to be, let's see, and the, there's a reason why I'm doing I squared over here. See what's going to happen here. This is going to be. Uh, negative 1 times negative 1 times i, or just i. Uh, anybody see something repeating now? Didn't that start repeating now? Let's see if i to the 6 would be the same thing as i squared. i to the 6th is i to the 2nd, i to the 2nd, i to the 2nd, which is negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. And the question is, do I get the same thing? Are these? Uh huh. So it has a cycle of four. Now, the only thing is, and again, the previous math textbook that we used, because it has a cycle of four, it used to make you divide the exponent by four, and then you had to remember three different cases. This is weird stuff. I like the way this book does it, because I squared. This is going to be the important one right here. Notice what I'm doing. I'm relating everything back to I squared. Because if I can get to I squared, I either know it's a bit of doing I squared times I squared times I squared. No, I don't think so. So how about if we just do this? Uh, that's what we did in the previous textbook. We divided this 20 by 4, but then you had to think of four different cases. That was weird. I think this is a lot easier to work through. So if I do this, i squared to the what will give me i to the 20th? Hey, 10th, right? Because we understand, remember, the, it's called the powers principle. You multiply powers. So if I can get everything in terms of i squared, I am done. So look at this here. I take i to the 20th. It becomes i squared to the 10th. And then I know that i squared is negative 1. And what's negative 1 to the 10th power? It's 1 because it's even. Cool. So everything gets sort of related back to one or negative one. Make a complex problem, make it a little easier. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. I could show the other way, but I think it'll get confused everybody else on which way to do it. So I'll just do it this way. Okay, so uh, this was the easy one, of course. Let's look at something a little more challenging. I to the 23rd power. See how that changes things. Well, first of all, notice the previous problem. It was a even power. This is an odd power. So I can't take i squared to something of an odd power. So what I do, i got to break this up. So how about this is i to the 22nd times i to the 1, or just i. Good. Will that make 23? Right? Remember, because whenever we multiply numbers, we just add exponents. So technically, this is 22 plus 1, the one I don't put down. Okay, now can you make that i to the 22 in terms of i squared? I go with that. i squared to the 11th times i. And then you know what? I'll put down every single step. But do you know automatically, can you go from here directly to the answer and be done? Yeah, should be able to, right? Because you know that i squared is negative 1 
negative 1 to the 11th power is still going to become a negative 1, and negative 1 times i should just give you negative i. So you can really go from step 2 all the way down to answer right away, knowing some of that. Okay, let's try another one here by yourself from beginning to end. All yours, have fun. Wait just a little bit longer. I see a few people still writing things down. All right, so let's see. I to the 50th is really I squared to the 25th. At that point, you could go directly to answer. I'll show you all the steps here. Of course, negative 1 to the 25th power is a negative 1. Good, good. I think a lot easier sort of system there. Okay, so that's that one. That's the whole concept of taking i to a certain power. All right, the next concept to deal with in this section is the whole issue of um, adding and subtracting. And what does it makes what makes uh, two complex numbers to be equal to each other? Okay, before we go there, let me go to here again. It's in your textbook, and I just didn't copy it down. So let me find it so we have it in front of us. It's on page 412. And it says that any complex number is going to be written as A plus BI. And so this part here is called the real part. Uh, this part here is called the complex part. And this whole thing, because there's something other than zero for i, this guy is called a complex number. Okay, uh, sometimes this little complex here is actually called imaginary as well. So kind of two different names. So it is the same thing? Yeah, uh-huh. But the whole the whole thing a plus b i is called a complex number. Uh, sometimes the just the b part would say, what's the imaginary part of this number? It's the b part. Okay, I think I mentioned this a little bit later on, but it'd be good to sort of mention it now. Whenever we started writing numbers, way way back when we were little kids here, we would write down like the number three, right? And it, Kind of interesting to realize in that writing that number, there's so much depth to it that we actually don't even know. Like um, when you wrote down the number three when you were a kid, did you know there was an exponent of one? Did you know that after this number there are variables, but they're all to the zero power? Okay. On top of that, there it was a it was a fraction always, right? And now we know this. Even beyond that, now we know that there was also always a imaginary part to numbers, but they always had a zero as their coefficient of i. So you write down the number three, but that's what's in there. And of course, you can take it more because we have something called ordinal numbers that keep it just it gets more and more and more complicated as you study advanced mathematics. It's kind of fun though. You kind of say like, wow, that was just a three. I thought it was a simple three, but yet there's so much depth of meaning in it. Okay, so let's go for it here. Uh, this one, now this one. Okay. So first of all, we've got to understand that complex numbers, if you say that two complex numbers are equal to each other, so A plus BI, and I'll just write C plus DI. That's kind of, there's two different numbers there. <laughs> If you say these two numbers are equal to each other, what needs to happen is A and C need to be equal to each other, as well as B and D. We good? Because again, 
that complex number is made up of two pieces. Okay, so let's go for it here. Now let me erase that because we're going to need it over here. So that means, oh, what? I didn't write it in. So that means this part here has to equal this part here. So the real part has to be the same. And if we do that, that means, do some work here, that means if these guys are the same, that means x had to have been equal to 2. And then we go over here, and then we say, okay, if these two numbers are the same, that means the imaginary part should have been equal to each other. And again, just making you realize this this number that we call a number, it actually is made up of two parts. So 7 is equal to negative 14y. What would y have to be? I'll go with negative 1 half. Is that right? Cool. So now let's see if these, if these two numbers are actually truly equal to each other. So we're going to plug in a 2 for the x. We're going to plug in a negative one half for the y. Let's see what happens. So 4 times 2 is 8, plus 7i equal to uh, 8 on this side. So negative 14 times negative one half. That becomes 7i. Yep, cool. So are these two numbers equal to each other? Yes, because the real part is equal to the real part. The imaginary part is equal to the imaginary part. Okay, again, make it realize that number is made up of two parts. Both parts need to be equal to each other to be equal. Okay, good there. I'll let you guys try the next one here by yourself. tiny bit more complicated. I think we can handle it here. Then again, there's the real part. Making sure those have to be equal to each other. All right, I'm going to start it as well here. So look up if you're stuck or look up if you're done. I'll slowly start putting up the answer. So if you copy me, you can copy me. <coughs> so the real part is done. Uh, and then the imaginary part. So 9 has to be equal to 4y plus 1. I mean, as long as you did the math correctly, that's fine. Question is, Mr. H, do you got to go ahead? Do you have to go and plug it back in? No, as long as you did the X and Y correctly. And again, it's just making you realize that the two numbers are equal to each other only if each of the parts are equal. All right, but let's go on then. So, and notice the, the real part and the imaginary part, they don't ever get sort of mixed up whenever you're adding, subtracting these things. They always stay distinct because they're distinct things. Okay, so let's go for it. Let's do one addition, one subtraction.
and again just as you imagine what's going to happen is because they need to stay distinct whenever you add these guys up you just add the real parts together five and six plus a negative four I go with the two I, is that right? There's your addition. Notice who you're just multi adding up the real parts and then adding up the complex or the imaginary parts. Okay, subtraction does the same. So let you guys try that one real quick here. Alright, so 6 subtract 4 has to be a 2, and then 5 subtract a 3, also 2 with an I next to it, we're good there. And again, if it helps to get rid of the, um, if you, if you want to get rid of the parentheses, yes, you can multiply this through with a negative 1 if you like. Then you can add each of the pieces together here. How about let's try another one here with a lot of negatives in it. So, subtraction with a whole bunch of negatives. All right, look at this one here again. Uh, 7 subtract 8. Hopefully you guys got a negative 1. And then looking at the imaginary part, how about a negative 1 subtract a negative 2? Plus 1. And then we really don't really need to write a 1 next to the i value. If you have an i there, forget the 1. Just write the i and be done. Okay, so that was addition and subtraction. Let's go on beyond that. Let's go to... Multiplication, and then we'll move on to division afterwards. All right, as you see, number 13, doesn't that look like a FOIL method, right? Just from polynomials. First term has to multiply the first term, and yep, you got it. It's the FOIL method all over again. So 2 times 1 is 2. And notice now there is a sort of intermingling of the real part and the imaginary part now. So 2 times negative 4i, negative 8i, cool, okay, so now let's multiply the 3i times everything, so 3i times 1, plus 3i. Okay, and this one, let's do it the long way now, but from here on out we're going to do it the short way, so let's do it one long way. 3 times negative 4 technically is a negative 12. i times i is i squared. Okay, then off to the side, what do we know that what happens here? So negative 12 times i squared is again what? Negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 12 is a positive 12. So you can write it like that each time, but you know what I usually do? I just multiply 3 times negative 4. makes negative 12, and I know if I'm going to have an i squared, I just change the sign on the 12. So just really a changing of your sign. All right, and let's see. 12 plus 2 is 14. Got that one. And negative 8 plus 3. Negative 5. And there is my multiplication between the two. Okay, same thing here. I'll let you guys handle number 14 by yourself, but think about it as distributive property, right?
All right, hopefully you guys got enough time here. So negative 3i times 2, which we will be a minus 6i. Again, negative 3 times positive 3 is a negative 9, but I'm going to have an i squared, so how about just plus 9? Why do an extra step if you don't have to? Now the only other issue I have, yeah, the real part always has to go first. The complex part always has to go in the back. So in this case, the 9 has to go first, minus 6i in the back. Take a look at two more here. First one, 2 plus 4i squared. All right, so even though it uh, looks like a certain kind of um, special form, it isn't. So what we're just going to do is we're just going to write 2 plus 4i times another 2 plus 4i, and then just do FOIL. So again, let you guys try FOIL by yourself. And uh, just wait. Uh, yeah, I guess you, you can do. You can do number 16 as well. 16 just is a regular foil. Um, 16 though is a special form, so we'll talk about it in just a bit here. Okay, let's go back to 15 here. So 15, 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 4i is a positive 8i. 4i times 2 is another positive 8i. That's cool. And then 4i times 4. Okay, hold on. 4 times 4 is 16. I'm going to get i squared. So how about a minus 16 here? All right, 4 and negative 16 make a negative 12, and then 8 plus 8 is 16, so how about 16i? Okay, this one is not considered a special form because we don't use it, in a sense, in a special way later on in mathematics. But 16 is considered a special form. We'll see why in just a bit here. So notice, uh, let's see what we've got here. We've got uh, two numbers, ex all the numbers are exactly the same except for the sign in the middle being changed. Remember from polynomials, what's so special about the sign in the middle being changed? What happens in the middle? And yeah, they all cancel. Perfect. So 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times a negative 5i would make a negative 15i. Uh, then the other one, 5i times 3, would make a positive 15i. Okay. Let's see if I can do this in my head here. So 5 times negative 5 is negative 25. But I know I'm going to have... And I squared, so therefore, how about a plus 25? All right, so 9 and 25 make 34, and then voila, yes, as I predicted, the sign of the middles have been, the two middle terms cancel because they're opposites of each other. So hold on, hold on, before we go anywhere else. Remember how this was a special form with square roots? Would anybody know the name of that? Any studious student remembered off the homework? Okay, they were called conjugates. Remember the conjugates? But this one, it, they don't have just square roots in it. They have i values in it. So what we do is we still call them a special form. We've got to change the name a little bit here. We call them complex conjugates. Cool. And again, this, the whole point here, though, is if you start off with values with i in it, after you do this process, you should want to find out with just, hey, that's a regular integer, isn't it? You got rid of the i piece, or the imaginary piece. So, hey, isn't this a real number then? So we went from complex, so we went from multiplying two complex numbers, and we came up with a, a real number. Cool. Okay, that's what complex conjugates are. Another little form, real quick here. If the middles are going to cancel, do I really need to multiply the outside and the inside term? No. Why do something if we don't have to? 
technically we should do, we see something like this. How about this? 3 times 3 is 9. 5 times negative 5 is negative 25, but I know it's going to have a negative. I know it's going to have i squared in it, so how about a plus 25, and do I get 34 as, yeah. So again, if you're going to multiply complex conjugates, just multiply the first terms and the last terms, and you're done. Why do we need complex conjugates? I'm glad you asked. Because I have an answer for it. Whenever we divide. So 3 plus 2i divided by 2 minus 5i. And your book calls it divide. All the other math books in the whole entire planet, they call it simplify. Because what you're doing is just simplifying this right here. So here's our problem. The problem is this right here. The problem is that you have an i right over here in your denominator. That is not considered simplified. So the i value should be all together, and the i value should not be in your denominator. So what should I multiply? 2 minus 5i to get rid of the i. You guys are quick learners. Okay. You multiply it by the complex conjugate. Whatever you do on the bottom, you have to do on the top. All right, let you guys get ahead of me a little bit here. Go for it. Can you multiply those out? The denominators are complex conjugates, but the numerators are not. So the numerators, you got to foil everything out on the numerators. All right, so again, on the complex conjugates on the bottom, no need to multiply everything. Just first terms, make a 4 over here. Last terms, make a positive 25. So how about a 29? On top, you got to do all the foil here. So I might as well put parentheses in here. So it's like a 2 times 3 is 6. Uh, 2 times 5i is 15i. You know what? I need more space here. So I'm going to extend this little quotient way, way, way out there. All right. 2i times 2 is a 4i, so plus 4i. And then, okay, so 2 times 5 is 10 with an i squared, which is minus 10. All right. And gathering together like terms here. Let's see. 6 and negative 10 make negative 4. Uh, 15i plus 4, how about a 19i all over 29? Okay, now we've got another little problem. Um, because these are complex numbers, the real part has to be by itself. The complex part has to be by itself. You can't do that. So this 29 has to divide each of these pieces. So the 29 divides the negative 4. And the 29 divides the 19. And notice what I did over here. Kind of depends what you want to do. You could put the put the i on top with the 19. Then you could put the i in back of the fraction. Almost always in math textbooks, the i stands as a multiplier to the fraction. Um, I don't think I've ever seen in a math textbook when it wasn't, but is it technically wrong if it is? No, it isn't. I mean, it's it's still okay to have it. Like Julian? That I don't know. I'll have to check that out. Okay. Yeah, let's check out what we do with the I values on the homework here. All right, and the last one here. Oh, before we get there, I got one little thing for you here. So notice you have a 2 minus 5i, you got 2 plus 5i. Notice, and then also remember the imaginary part, always in the back of the number, right? So if this was a 0 instead of a 2, 
the bottom number would have been a negative 5i. The conjugate of that would have been a positive 5i. We're good? So technically, it's the sign change in front of the i term. So I got 3 plus 2i over i. First question is, what's the conjugate? Perfect. Negative i to get that conjugate over here. The conjugate on top would also be a negative i there. As you multiply by 1. All right, I'll let you guys finish that one off. Let's see what you guys get. All right, so let's see. I'm going to try it as well here. So technically, it's a positive 1 times a negative 1 is negative 1, but I have an i squared. So negative 1 of i squared is positive 1. That's cool. On top, it's kind of like you got that distributive property going again here. So negative i times 3, negative 3i. Negative i times 2i, so again, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. But then I got an i squared, so it becomes plus 2. So since you have a 1, that is a whole number now. The 1 goes away completely, and the 2 has to go in front, the 3i in the back. So how about 2 minus 3i is your final answer. All right, any questions on that one? There's usually one or two questions, depending on which part you got stuck on. Look at that, perfectly an hour.